Okay, hi guys. Uh, thank you for joining me. Uh, my name is Itai Bogner. I'm the founder and CTO of Sarascale. Uh, we'll talk a bit about uh, hyperconvergence and uh, OpenStack. Uh, I built a presentation which is more educational, okay? So I'm not trying to sell you a product today. If you want me to sell you something, come tomorrow. I have 20 minutes to sell you a product. So I hope that you'll find the session educational. Um, hyperconvergence is an emerging segment of the market, and I'm biased, of course. I believe that uh, hyperconvergence is the next architecture in uh, data centers. And I'll, for, for those who are not in, uh, familiar with hyperconvergence, I'll talk a couple of slides about hyperconvergence and what does it mean. And then I'll cover uh, what uh, needs to be done to open stack changes, etc., to make it uh, suitable for a hyperconverged uh, infrastructure as a, as a hyperconverged infrastructure solution. So, uh, really, a brief uh, history uh, of data center architecture. It's really a couple of seconds. Uh, it started with single servers, obviously. So the storage was server-side storage. There was there were workloads running on the same server, and that worked great. Okay, it was reasonably uh, good in terms of pricing. The problem usually was with the reliability of the storage, not because the disk weren't okay, but if the node went down, then you lost all storage. So the next phase of data center architectures were split infrastructure. This is, again, this is a high level brief history, so don't, uh, don't, let's not argue about all the phases in between. Split infrastructure was all about having the storage in one end, EMC, you know, what's called the sun, different fabric, and the compute workloads running on servers. They used two different fabrics. They didn't share anything besides the fact that you can access storage from the workload. That, work, that, that is working today really great. Uh, it's very expensive, both on the CAPEX side. Uh, storage systems are very expensive. Uh, both on the OPEX side, uh, it takes, uh, you have to have a storage admin, you need to manage loons and all that uh, stuff with storage. And basically, uh, this is what the, the dominant architecture today in data centers uh, that we see today. Uh, the next generation, okay, and, uh, as I said, I'm biased, is hyper-converged infrastructure. In this uh, architecture, we're basically going back to server-side storage. So uh, the technological trend that we are riding on is the ability to build a cluster of servers connected with a 10 gig, e, 10 gig Ethernet end up interconnect. And you manage this cluster of servers as one holistic, in a one holistic solution, serving both the storage needs, the compute needs, and obviously all the networking that you know, makes things happen. Um, a very uh, brief history of hyperconvergence because it's really an emerging segment and there are very few solutions out there today. So today's solutions are basically marrying two distinct subsystems. You take a, usually a distributed storage system. You probably most of you are familiar with Ceph, although Ceph wasn't exactly designed to be uh, deployed on a hyperconverged architecture, but it is a distributed uh, storage system and a hypervisor, it can be KVM, VMware, or any uh, of, of, of those solutions that are available today, you install them on the same servers, and this is a hyperconverged solution. Problem being is that those two subsystems are basically black boxes to one another. They are using the same fabric, okay, the 10 gig interconnect. It's not a split infrastructure anymore. And uh, they are managing their resources independently, meaning if there is a virtual machine running on KVM, VMware, or whatever, that suddenly needs more CPU cycles, more memory, more network bandwidth, it may interfere with the storage solution that is running on the same node. Okay, so this is what at least I call first generation uh, hyperconvergence. It's really an emerging segment working very well. So there are very successful companies uh, in this space, despite the limitations that I outlined. Now, um, what I want to cover in this session is let's build a great hyperconverged OpenStack solution. Uh, and uh, as I said, I hope to cover 
uh, most of the issues that we tackled in Stratoscale. Uh, I'll try not to insert a lot of shameless uh, plugs about uh, my company, but I'm not promising anything, so from time to time I will mention my company. Um, so let's uh, start. So in terms of the requirements, okay, we, we are seeking to build a, a software-only solution. Okay? It's a single infrastructure. It serves all the needs of a cloud solution. You can store everything on that cloud. You can run anything on that cloud, VMs, containers, whatever. Obviously, uh, you would like it to be performant. You would like it to be reliable and you would like it to be efficient. So there are many considerations when building a hyper-converged uh, solution. Again, I won't be able to cover everything in this session, uh, but a couple of points you can see on the slide. Uh, the storage is uh, 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 dictating the failure domain. Okay, so if you are looking at a couple of recs, and I'll cover that uh, in a bit, uh, you need to understand how, what's the topology of the network and distribute the storage according to the topology. We'll cover that. Hardware heterogeneity. So if you have a, a small cluster, you would like, probably like the nodes to be very similar because uh, you need the storage to be serve, being served from the same servers. The, the bigger the cluster, you can, uh, then you can introduce more heterogeneity into the cluster and have bigger nodes with more storage on them or nodes with more compute on them. And then as the cluster grows and you feel that uh, the cluster, let's say, lacks uh, enough storage in, in terms of capacity, then you can introduce more nodes which are um, oriented to be more storage node rather than compute node. But again, remember, in all cases, we are running the workloads on all the nodes and all the nodes are serving storage requests. Uh, other uh, uh, considerations are performance and resource utilization. As I said before, uh, the storage subsystem is also using memory and CPU cycles, obviously, and it's using networking, it's using bandwidth on the same fabric. Workloads are using uh, that uh, as well, meaning the same resources. <coughs> and we need to somehow compensate or manage as we call it, manage the interference, and we'll cover that as well. So uh, I'll, here I'm going to cover the three basic building blocks. So we'll start with uh, 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 describing uh, the storage subsystem, the networking, and the compute subsystems. Uh, in a storage subsystem, basically you take all the server-side storage, all, all the locally attached hard drives that reside on the server, you aggregate all the blocks under a single namespace, okay? So you have basically one big, huge block device. And per VM, per workload, you carve out volumes, which are, volume is obviously a, a, a subset of the blocks on the block device. There's no need for a storage admin, no need for managing loons. The workloads that are running inside the hyperconverged infrastructure, what they see is from their perspective, they see a locally attached hard drive. The performance is, is great because all the uh, IOPS are actually distributed across the cluster. So you can actually, blocks are uh, uh, residing on multiple nodes. You can do a lot of load balancing there so you don't have to read the same block from the same node all the time because you keep replicas inside. So uh, mentioning replicas, obviously the storage subsystem needs to be reliable. Okay, so we, uh, the distributed storage subsystem needs to keep two or three replicas of each storage block on multiple nodes because you don't want to be susceptible to node failures. And that's what makes the storage subsystem reliable. Uh, the compute subsystem. So the key message I want you to take out of thinking about the compute subsystem is that you need to have very fine grain control of what the hypervisor is doing. Okay, let's say if there is a VM that suddenly needs more CPU cycles, I want to be aware of that very, very quickly. The same goes for memory, and so on and so forth. The reason being is that in a hyperconverged infrastructure, again, you are susceptible to interference between the subsystems that are running on the same server, and uh, you would like to do some kind of a cluster-wide load balancing 
of the workloads, of the resources, to prevent or manage those uh, uh, interference and collisions and contention points that you are susceptible when you are running on a hyperconverged infrastructure. Uh, the networking. So again, we are running on a single shared fabric. This fabric is hosting or uh, transferring a, a couple of different types of traffic. It's the guest traffic, management traffic, the storage, live migration, so on and so forth. So obviously, there needs to be a subsystem doing quality of service, traffic shaping on, on this internal fabric. Again, in a first generation hyperconverged solution, there's a lot of interference between the various subsystems, specifically the storage and the compute, because there's zero awareness on the resource utilization on, uh, of, from both those two subsystems. In what we are building today, and this is what obviously Statoscale has built, we are building a, a, a hyper-converged, vertically integrated a, a solution. So all the subsystems are fully aware of each other, and we know how to do a very good resource balancing inside the cluster. So a very high level traits of the solution uh, uh, from the control plane. So uh, we would like to have a very scalable installation process, literally talking about the ability to install hundreds of servers uh, very easily. We envision that future data centers, especially in ISPs, uh, are going to just bring in more racks of, uh, of computers and they are going to be connected to the same cluster in real time, meaning during operations, and we would like to add those nodes to the cluster. Same goes for, uh, um, um, we are using the best practice of distributed system. You, do, you want the system to be reliable. You don't want it to be uh, having a single point of failure, so on and so, so, on and so forth. We mentioned a couple of times a uh, fine-grained control of the resource utilization in the subsystems. Once you have that ability, you can do a very efficient cluster-wide resource balancing. Again, if there is a VM interfering with another VM, if there is a VM interfering with the stor storage on a specific node, you need to be able to either move the VM, to do traffic shaping, whatever you need to do in order to prevent this contention. So this is the downside, so supposedly, of, of hyperconvergence is that you have, you need to manage this interference. Uh, so uh, we talked about the installer. So we are using a single image. This single image includes all the services that the hyperconverged uh, solution requires. Specifically in the OpenStack parallels, it's uh, Cinder, Nova, and the rest, the key, Keystone, etc. the rest of the subsystems. We are deploying the same image on all of the servers in the cluster. So all of the servers actually contain the same image. There's no, uh, we are not appointing any specific server to be a manager in the cluster. All the decisions are being based on consensus and uh, uh, there's no need to do sizing on hardware. Okay, you don't need to have a very uh, big hardware with a lot of memory, let's say CPU cycles, in order to be uh, uh, managing the cluster. Um, uh, distributed system. So I mentioned in the previous slide that the image is the same. Now, what you see here is sort of like a table. On the, on the left-hand side, you see services. So each service has a different factor for scaling out. For instance, we know that Cinder needs to be uh, three times more nodes, more services, more instances of the service than Keystone or whatever the measurement is. Okay, so every service has a different factor, a scaling factor, and the distributed system knows how to start and stop instances of those specific services on specific nodes according to a lot of runtime insights that we are collecting inside the cluster. Okay, so again, the system itself, managing the system itself uh, requires CPU cycles, requires memory, requires networking, and we know how to balance our own services so they do not compete with, on resources with the workloads and the storage subsystem. So I hope the, the message is clear. We are building a vertically integrated solution and managing all the resources in a very holistic manner. 
uh, specifically to the storage. So this is a great example. So the storage, again, is a distributed storage subsystem. So every node is both a storage client, okay? Here you see the block storage client and a block storage server, okay? The block storage client is serving these volumes to the workloads, okay? And when it gets a read, uh, an IOP operation, it knows immediately how to go to the correct server to serve the block storage. There's no need, there's no metadata server in this architecture. Please note, okay? Every block of storage is one hop away from the workload. Meaning, if we are doing a live migration of the workloads, we are not copying storage, we do not, not need to update any metadata. Everything is distributed by nature and there's a single hope, it's a mathematical function if you will, that every client of storage knows where the appropriate block for read or write operation resides inside the cluster. We know how to do storage tiering, so you see the nodes that I draw here on the slide, they do not contain the same amount of uh, storage, the different number of uh, hard drives, let's say, and we know how to carve out uh, uh, tiers. We, we, we know how to uh, use flash and uh, uh, hard drives, and we know how to, uh, again, expose that as very efficient, different storage tier with different capabilities. Um, networking, we mentioned before uh, traffic shaping and managing the interconnect. So again, there's a single interconnect, doesn't matter whether you literally have multiple links. The interconnect is a shared resources, and this shared resource is being used for guest traffic, public traffic management, live migration, storage, so on and so forth. You need to manage the traffic there. You need to prevent, you need to uh, adhere to SLAs that customers are applying on workloads. So we take everything into account. We sort of like compile, if you will, some kind of a rule base for traffic shaping and queues, etc. And this is an integral part of the system. Maybe it's even the most sensitive part in a hyper-converged infrastructure, again, because it's a single shared resource and it's imperative that you manage that single uh, resources uh, 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 and adhering to your policies. Uh, we talked a bit about uh, failure domains and, and, and what dictates the failure domain. So the topology in here, I'm showing the two blue boxes are Rex residing on data center uh, A or data center one. And there's another Rex, let's say in data center two. Okay, the distributed storage system no, needs to know how to work inside Rex, across Rex, and across data centers. Okay, so there's a lot of logic of where do you place blocks of storage and you need to adhere to policies and failure domain rules and affinity rules and anti-affinity rules. A very complex subject. Again, I'm giving you a taste here of the complexity of the solution. Um, we mentioned also load balancing. So there is an analytics layer. And I mentioned a couple of times having the ability to have a fine-grained control of uh, the resource utilization on the, all of the subsystems and collecting very efficiently runtime insights of the system. So we are collecting a lot of runtime insights on the system, a lot of metrics, runtime red metrics. We are uh, sort of like processing them, okay, in various levels of intensity. So there are some sort of like algorithms that are working on a, a couple of seconds, minutes, and there are other algorithms that are literally working in a sub-second uh, latency to make decisions to prevent or solve uh, interference problems that happen on the spot. Um, it requires fine-grained control on CPU scheduling, fine-grained control on throttling networking, and very efficient and low latency live migration of virtual machines. Again, one of the things that we do in order to solve interference is we might decide to move VMs. It can be the offending VM that actually consumes a lot of CPU cycles, let's say on a specific node, or the neighboring VMs in order to allow this offending VM to continue to work. So there's also a lot of algorithms that we are developing in order to make the best decisions on this cluster-wide uh, load balancing. 
there's a, an admission control process where we have a workload. It's being analyzed for a couple of seconds, and then we are, that's an initial profiling, and then we are continuing profiling the workload, and all the time making fine adjustments to how a specific workload is, is uh, running, how much, how, may, uh, how much CPU cycles to give it, how, many, uh, how much memory to give it, so on and so forth. Um, other technical uh, aspects of the system, this is really high level, uh, internally, uh, we use console I.O. I'm not sure whether everyone is familiar with console I.O. Uh, it's uh, sort of like similar to ETCD, coming from CoreOS, it's coming from HashiCorp. Uh, it's a key store distributed uh, database, if you will. Uh, 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 the nice thing about it is it exposes uh, parts of its r registry, if you will, as DNS, and we are using it for uh, uh, deploying our internal services in a highly available and use uh, and, and load balance manner. There is a problem with it. It's, it's strongly consistent, meaning the, uh, today, with to, the, today's uh, uh, version of console I.O., it, it, it doesn't, uh, if, if, if too many nodes fall, it, it uh, gets into a lockup situation and we are solving that, okay? So we know how to work in a split plane environment. And that's, that's what we, we did. Again, if you look at the multiple rec scenario, the likelihood of the uplink between the recs to go down is higher than the, the, the links inside the rec to be disconnected. And if a link inside the rec is disconnected, you lose one server. And if an uplink is disconnected, you lose, you get a two a split brain situation. Those two recs can continue to work. Presumably they have the, the, the all of the storage, all of the compute. And this is part of the placement algorithms that I mentioned uh, also. Uh, to give you an example on how to, to work with a service, it doesn't matter which service, in a regular, uh, in a typical environment, uh, there is a request, and uh, uh, this request, when it comes in, usually it goes to an HA proxy, which is doing a load balancing for you, and then it reaches instances of the subsystem. The way it works with a, a, a console I.O. what we did is sharding, okay? So you can, you, you can use sharding as long as you control the request side, meaning in a typical web, public web, web server when the request, you do not control the requests, then you cannot use sharding. In our scenario, all the systems are talking internally, okay? Nova is talking to Cinder, so on and so forth. Everyone is talking with Key, uh, Keystone. So we are using console I.O. As a, a, with its ability to resolve DNS and do health checks on the services. So console IO, we give it a script. It knows how to do health check on, on the various instances per service. It knows how to build the DNS responses. So once, let's say, Nova is trying to connect to Keystone, we are resolving a DNS name, keystone.service.datacenter. Those are implementation details and we are getting an instance, one of the instances of Keystone inside a cluster. So everything is done on the client side with the help of, of console and not, we don't have another middleware that we need to take care of. So this is one of the ways to make a system uh, highly available and, uh, and, and reliable and load balancing. Uh, another example is uh, self-healing. So what uh, we wanted to achieve is we didn't want to keep a lot of context on the requester side. So let's say Nova is asking Cinder to do some operation. What happens if there, there are many, many use, uh, uh, points that the, the operation can fail? Okay, so the question is who is responsible for the garbage collection? Okay, if the, let's say the create volume failed in the middle. And in our case, what we built, we built a system where, uh, again, we use sharding. We get an instance to do the operation on, how, on our behalf. Let's say that this instance fails, okay? We automatically go over to the second instance, okay? And we continue from there. We get a response. We, we are doing a publish and subscribe with message queue to other uh, interested parties who want to listen to the result of the operation. But the interesting part is that we are doing the garbage collection, okay, 
on, uh, uh, on the subsystem side, which is entirely self-contained and not on the requestor. The reason being is that the subsystem has enough metadata and knowledge you know, uh, and it knows how to do a better b garbage collection than an external entity like the requester. So in the case of, let's say, Nova and Cinder, where some, uh, someone asks Cinder, let's say, to mount a volume or whatever, uh, if, if there needs to be some garbage collection inside the block device, the subsystem that is managing the block device is doing that and not the requester. Uh, wrapping up, I hope that you know I showed you um, you know how to build a, a hyperconverged open SAC solution. Okay, and again the idea is that you're taking a cluster of servers connected with a 10 gig NAP interconnect, and you're serving all the cloud needs, resource needs, the storage, the compute, and the networking from within that cloud. You do not need, you can use a external storage, but you do not need it. You can use any other of the uh, subsystems, but in a hyper-converged uh, solution, everything is internal, everything is reliable, and everything is self-healing. Uh, okay, thank you very much.